So let's let's just chat about the background. We have classic data flow model. Our users uh, take action on the website and receive updates or responses while using the site. The company in turn provides users with content and receives report on user action. The solution originally started on Postgres back in the early 2000s. I guess some of you were just born around uh, then while I was graduating from university. To enable scheduled reporting and data archiving, we send it to Hive Daily or our some data gets sent to SSAS Cube for analytics. We are now working on migrating from Hive to Snowflake with Looker uh, for reporting. The reason is because the client wants to switch from on-prem to cloud, and this migration is one of the first steps we need to take to fully migrate. Uh, data exchange with partners uh, performed mostly via AWS S3. So why do we handle everything in time series database? Time series databases are specialized databases designed to handle and analyze data points that are shared with specific timestamps or time intervals. They are widely used in various domains, such as finance, IoT, monitoring systems, and more. This type of uh, database allows for an easier way to build historical reports with backward analytics because all data points are tied to specific date and time stamp. It also allows for an easier and faster way to recreate or recalculate data sets and re re reports based on renewed historical data. These are key benefits to us, but there is a lot more than you can find on Wikipedia. To implement a time series database, uh, most of our tables must have standard fields like date or date and hour. Hive table must also be partitioned by date or date and hour. If you are using Snowflake, the data should be clustered, you guessed it, by date or by date and hour. We are also using stamps. Stamps like a label that shows us reporting data for a specific period of time it is ready. Stamps in Hive are just regular files, but in HDFS. So why do we handle everything in time series database? First, we need to manage our data, and to do that, we build a custom ETL tool. This tool allows us to move our data between our data storages while transforming and processing during the transfer. And to this, we then added a stamp service. The stamp service uh, keeps records about source target services, uh, table, uh, date, date and hour, initiator and other. The goal is to be able to use stamp service to instantly check what data is available without making a request to the database itself. Uh, we also using STAM service to check data readiness for reporting. And lastly, we have an API service that helps us to work with STAM service. So just not to query database every time if data is ready, we have special STAM service which allows us to do such checks. So for now, now uh, our last block gets a standard and uh, we now have not just stamps, but also a stamp service used for data readiness, reporting, and API requests. Now, let's talk about the custom ETL tool we're using. The tool does the following. It allows us to connect to all data sources we're using. It allows us to run stamp check before any ETL steps are taken. It manages the entire ETL process. It also allows us to set step and task dependencies to that steps or tasks are performed in the order we need them to be performed in. Lastly, it sets a stamp view for a successful run. Let's check ETL task configuration example. So, it's just like a regular XML file with 
some box about the description, the description scheduling rules, connections, and following inside. Uh, and just uh, next step, uh, let's look at configuration example for our tool. The first one is direct table transfer. So it's a flow and task definition. Inside we have a source defined with connection, namespace, and table name. We have target, also with connection, namespace, and table name. Uh, dependency, uh, which stamp need to be checked prior to run this given transfer, uh, or which stamp we need to wait until it uh, will be accessible in stamp service. And also we have uh, a section on success, what to do on success. And typically we set a stamp regarding this, this given transfer is okay. Next example is uh, task dependency. For example, we have a uh, few tasks. And uh, first, uh, and one pipeline, and one task, uh, one pipeline has a two tasks, whereas a second one is dependent on the first one. And instead of stamp checking, we are adding a requirement for the first task to be completed prior to the second one. So just easy, we can we can check by for stamps, we can check for tasks, we can combine both of the, both of both type of the dependencies in this block of requirements. And this way we handle the dependencies. And last example, we are using DDL and SQL files in our transfers. So in, uh, instead of direct table transfer, we and defining our data sources as query results and we are using the SQL and DDL files if a table not exists. So here we have SQL query, define it in some file, and then in target we just define in DDL uh, which way we will create a target table. Uh, most uh, by default, uh, the tool transferring the most recent partition have a writing existing one on target, but we have a lot of options to set partition scope to be transferred as well as uh, with extensive variable definition for development and production modes. So we can uh, use different uh, naming <coughs> for production and uh, for development, meaning you can run it uh, when you run it in development, it can work with your product schema when you switch to, the, to production, it's using production names. Next slide, challenges. Nothing good comes without a challenge. Let's talk about some common issues I've experienced while migrating from high to snowflake. The first thing I want to show you is the difference between data insertion into high and snowflake tables. In high, we use typical state and insert override by partition, but in snowflake, we need to use delete state and prior insert because it doesn't support insert override. And uh, in this case, uh, snowflake just will add data rather than overwriting it. So we need to add one more statement to delete uh, previous data. And also we put in this into transaction. So, we will work, it works this way. And a few other challenges you may experience. Uh, uh, it's a UDF code migration. Uh, complex source classes, hierarchy, and dependencies. Uh, some snowflake UDF limitation. For example, no recursions in UDFs for SQL UDFs inside in Snowflake. Restrictions in Snowflake for using external libraries, for example, uh, JSON in Java. 
So, for example, in Java, you need to uh, use external library, but Snowflake doesn't allow to use it. And that's why we processing uh, JSON in UDF via JavaScript. And uh, tricky, but engine specific uh, division by zero. Uh, Processed different ways in Hive it allows to do that and returns no, but in Snowflake it returns an error. So let's wrap up. Use approach allows us to process huge amount of time series data in quite effective way. Some of our tables contain our 150 billion records per day. Uh, key points of giving solution are uh, stamp service. Uh, it allows us to be ensured about data readiness for transfer, reporting, or processing uh, without uh, querying database. Uh, data structuring, partitioning by date and hour for fast filtering and, uh, by date range, and UDFs. So our UDFs uh, covers most uh, most of our tasks uh, and quite complex logic. And it's easily managed by, with Java, with my version, everything with code management. And cons, we, for now, since uh, for previous 10 years, we have a lot of UDFs written in Java. We can't transfer them to Snowflake directly because of high uh, hierarchical classes uh, and uh, third party libraries used. And also it requires high LOE to do that. That's it. So if you have any questions, I'm glad to answer. Uh, yeah, guys, if uh, someone has uh, questions regarding this uh, information, uh, this presentation, please unmute and ask. Uh, 